Well, and so Charlotte, please take it away. Oh, um, first of all, thanks so much uh, for having me here um, virtually, I suppose. Uh, and also, um, <laughs> thank you for uh, for scheduling this because um, so usually I, I like to have people follow along um, with the talk um, on the um, preprint on the archive or with the paper if it's available. But um, I literally just posted the the corresponding paper for this on, or submitted it to the archive an hour ago. Um, and uh, so you can guess when I finished my slides, but um, I, uh, I assure you that um, regardless of how recently that occurred, we will still have some fun. Um, oh, and so, all right, so that's my, that's my disclaimer. Um, all right, so yes, I am Charlotte Ayton, and I'm here today to talk um, about some joint work with Alex Yosevich, um, whose surname is also challenging for people to pronounce. Um, and so uh, we actually generalized a result of uh, Alex's and um, Derek Hart's uh, from 2008. And so, uh, well, let's get into some of the background before I discuss what we actually did. Oh, and I suppose also, um, especially since it seems like it's not a huge group here, like feel free to interrupt me if something's clear, unclear, if there's a typo, um, then um, just go right ahead. Okay. So first of all, as, um, as some of you in the audience may know even better than me, um, Erdős and Zemeretti uh, made the following significant conjecture in additive number theory. Uh, if A is a finite set of integers um, consisting of n elements, then either um, A plus A, which is the, um, the element-wise sum, so this would be the set of all little a1 plus little a2, where uh, the ais are in the set A, um, so either that set or the corresponding set where addition is replaced by multiplication must have size at least um, some constant depending on epsilon n to the two minus epsilon for any positive epsilon. So um, this conjecture um, is basically saying that uh, given any set of integers, either um, the sum set a plus a or the product set a times a must be uh, large. Or in other words, you can't have a set that has a lot of additive and multiplicative structure simultaneously. So uh, this conjecture naturally leads one to the consideration of the size of sets of the form a times a plus a times a, where um, each of these operations is performed um, as described above. And uh, this uh, perhaps might remind you of um, taking the uh, dot product of um, two elements in a uh, two-dimensional vector space. Uh, this looks like x1 times x2 plus y1 times y2. And um, we'll see that that analogy is going to be very relevant. So uh, Hart and Yosevich had previously shown that if we have a set of points in a d-dimensional vector space over fq, so now we're um, doing something which is quite popular to do. We're taking that um, problem in the um, setting over the integers or over the real numbers, and we're replacing that with a finite field uh, with Q elements. And so uh, if we have a collection of vectors in this uh, vector space over uh, FQ, um, then if uh, that set E has size at least Q to the D plus one over two, um, then actually all non-zero members of FQ uh, must be contained in um, the image of that set under um, pi. This is this is bar pi, not the usual <laughs> pi, where pi is any non-degenerate bilinear form. And the dot product, so the case where pi of x, y is, um, well, x1, y1 plus x2, y2, and so on and so forth, up to xd, yd, uh, that is actually an example of a non-degenerate bilinear form, although there are many other ones. And so um, this result is actually pretty flexible in that it doesn't really require us to use the dot product, although that's sort of the, the motivating example and the obvious choice if we were interested in sizes of sets like this, since these are things that look like um, the outputs of a dot product. So um, this estimate can be used to show that if we have some um, subset of FQ, of non-zero elements of FQ, 
if we have a large enough subset A, then actually all non-zero elements of FQ can be written as um, the sum of, of pairwise products of things in A, where this, this A squared is just taken to mean one of these A dot A's, and there are, there are D many of these A dot A's being summed together, which is again the setwise sum that we used above. Charlotte, can I jump in with a question? Yep. So the star usually, so this is like a group of units, or is your Q always prime here? Is, is this literally everything but zero or? Oh yeah, so I mean, I mean, uh, so FQ, FQ is the finite field with Q elements. So uh, Q doesn't have to be prime, it can be composite. Um, and okay. as in um, most things in this area, two is not a prime and therefore there, <laughs> we won't consider things like the finite field of order 16, although that is most certainly a thing. Um, okay. Yeah, so so generally, I mean, a Q is an odd prime power is basically um, what the situation will be. Does okay. that? Um, that helps. Yep. Yeah. So basically, like showing that you have all these things means that basically you have everything. So it's like it's a very strong statement, right? That you contain all these elements. Yeah, absolutely. So, like for example, I guess to maybe you know bring it more down to the number theory, which uh, you know is I guess you know, another big part of the motivation is that, uh, so if A was actually a cyclic subgroup of um, FQ star under multiplication, so a cyclic, you know, a multiplicative subgroup of FQ, in other words, then um, then actually this statement would be saying that um, if you had a big enough subgroup, then every element would be able to be written as um, a sum of products of pairs of elements in that subgroup and so, for example, if uh, if A is actually a subgroup and the size of A is Q minus one um, over S, then A should consist of S powers. Um, and so then, uh, so then this would be saying something like every. I'm sorry. Was there? A oh, no, no. Oh. no, there was not a question. Yep, sorry. I was just hearing feedback. Um, yeah. So uh, yeah, so A would consist of S powers, and so then this would be saying something like every non-zero member of um, the finite field of order Q can be written as um, oh, this should be a bold F. Uh, should can be written as a uh, a sum of S powers of d d many S powers, which is um, uh, kind of like the um, wearing problem. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So uh, so that's actually that's actually the connection with with number theory, although we're not assuming in general that our subset A has any multiplicative or additive structure to it. Cool, thank you. Yep. And so, um, okay, so we're going to generalize this uh, estimate to the case that pi is actually a multilinear form. Um, so uh, we'll see that, we'll see examples of multilinear forms in a minute, but they'll uh, sort of uh, look like things like the dot product where instead of having terms like x1, y1, we'll have terms like x1, y1, z1, um, but otherwise it's, it's quite similar. All right, so that's sort of the basic motivation or introduction. And now uh, for the outline of the rest of the talk, um, oh, I should take like 50 minutes overall, right? So I have Okay, yes, thank you. So um, I'll talk about some preliminaries on forms. Uh, we actually need several new concepts in order to correctly generalize the estimate that um, Yosevich and Hart gave before. Um, and then I'll give the main result that we have, which is um, a straight generalization of their geometric estimate uh, for their 2008 paper. And um, then I'll give an application in the case that n equals three and d equals two, where n, is, um, n equals three means we have a ternary form um, or a trilinear form, and d equals two means we're going to be working over fq squared, um, as in the two-dimensional vector space over fq. Um, and then, and then I'll, I'll uh, mention why this result, this theorem that I give, is actually um, <laughs> vacuously true in almost all cases, um, except fortunately not the not the one that I will give examples from. So it turns out that. Um, <laughs> It turns out that a generalization is most certainly possible, but in a way that's not entirely trivial, it, it degenerates outside of the case that um, Hart and Yosevich already did, um, the trivial case where d equals one, which is, is not interesting, and the case where n equals three and d equals two. So for some reason, we're only allowed to have that one new situation. 
And um, and then finally, um, given time, I'll give a sketch of uh, I'll give a sketch of the proof itself, which is again quite similar to the one of um, Carton Yosevich, and I'll discuss where our stiffer is. So uh, so some preliminaries. So first of all, given two vector spaces over FQ, oh, and throughout everything is going to be a finite dimensional vector space. We're not doing any kind of functional analysis here in that sense. Um, I'm going to use box time so that the square with the cross in it um, to indicate the uh, canonical map that takes pairs of elements, uh, one from V and one from W, and sends it to the and sends that pair to the corresponding tensor. So um, this is uh, the canonical map that can be used to define the tensor product. And so, um, okay, so so that's going to be important to us because we'd like to consider things like um, like E. Uh, so. Um, the box tensor power of E n times, by which I mean that I want to um, that I want to take E and uh, and uh, form this set. Oh. So, in other words, I want to make all of the um, pure tensors that I can from elements of E. Um, and so in general, this consists of things that look like E1 tensor, E2 tensor, blah, 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 up to En, where each of the EI are elements of E. And so in general, this is not, um, this is not a vector space. Um, e is just some subset of, um, of FQ. Um, so uh, this in general is an effector space. It's just the set of all pure tensors, pure N tensors, if you will, that can be made from um, the elements of E. Now, if E is actually a subspace of a vector space V, in addition to being a subset, then um, this E circle tensor N is also defined, and that's the usual N fold tensor product of the vector space E, the subspace E with itself N times. And so um, unfortunately, I do need to make this distinction um, and so the box essentially is all the pure tensors you can make and um, and the circle of times for when it is defined is, is the actual n-fold tensor product of the vector space with itself. Um, and of course the, um, the n-fold um, pure tensors are much smaller than the corresponding vector space in the case that both are defined. Um, okay, and so then an n-linear form is a linear transformation from the n-fold um, tensor power of V, some vector space V with itself to the underlying field F when V is an F vector space. And again, in our case, that field F will also will always be a finite field of prime power order, um, of odd prime power order. But uh, in general, we could define this over any field. And so for example, the usual dot product over FQD, so in this case, our V would just be FQD, um, that is a bilinear form or um, the case, or in other words, it's the case n equals two, um, because we can view that dot product as uh, a map from, um, well, the tensor square of FQD. So in other words, from FQD uh, tensor FQD uh, to the underlying field FQ. And so um, in other words, um, uh, so the fact that we're taking a tensor product and not the direct product of these two vector spaces is encoding that the dot product is, is linear in each coordinate separately if we fix all the, the values of all the other coordinates. Okay, so are there any questions on the, um, what I mean by an n linear form at this point? Okay. So um, just some notation, I'll write form VN um, when I mean the collection of all um, n linear forms. And because I'm already using the asterisk to indicate the non-zero elements of, um, of, of a vector space or of FQ, I'm just going to say that form VN is the, the dual space, which I'm not going to use the star to denote, um, of the, the n-fold um, tensor power of the vector space V. OK, so that's where all forms live. And then um, if I have some form um, over a vector space V, which again, we're thinking of as being a finite dimensional vector space over FQ, then, um, 
if I take some subset of my vector space V and then some element T uh, in my underlying field, the T level set of this form pi with respect to the set E is um, the set of uh, all pairs ZW where Z is an N minus one fold pure tensor and W is an element of E so that pi of ZW is T and so now what does this pi of ZW mean exactly? Well, I should be feeding pi things that come from n-fold tensors over V. And so this is actually Z tensor uh, W, but of course we'll tend to um, use notation like this. And this is kind of, seems like a, a kind of subtle distinction, but the, the fact that I need to uh, separate these out comes from an asymmetry in the argument um, that we'll use to prove the main theorem. So that will be deferred until way in the end. But there is a reason for this sort of pedantic um, asymmetry here. And it is important that this is all of the pure tensors you can make from E and not a more general span of those, those guys. OK, so in any case, this seems like a little, a little strange <laughs> um, generalization in the sense that in the n equals 2 case, this would just be pairs of elements from E. but it turns out this is the appropriate generalization of the level set um, corresponding to T, where it's, in effect, all of the inputs that we can feed into um, pi from the set E so that uh, T is the value that the form outputs. Um, and again, I apologize for this particularly weird splitting here, but we'll see that uh, basically it's what we need to be able to apply cauchy schwartz um, OK. And so um, the nu of t uh, is going to be the size of this level set. And so now, if we had a form and some subset E of our vector space, and we could show that for every non-zero t, nu of t was positive, then uh, we would have shown that all non-zero elements of fq um, were actually uh, contained in the image of the set E under um, the form pi, which I might just write um, like this. And so uh, where again, this means pi applied to all of the pure tensors that you can make out of the elements of E. I'm just going to be lazy and write E to the n instead of E to the box n. Uh, OK, so um, that's kind of a hint as to what our uh, result will, um, what, our, what the proof of our result will be. OK, so um, now I can't just consider any possible um, form, just like in the original result of um, Hart and Yosevich, it turns out that uh, most forms won't have any interesting um, result along these lines. Uh, but uh, we can make an argument if our form is not degenerate in some sense. And so, um, so first of all, uh, to get towards what a non-degenerate multilinear form is, um, in, our, in our case anyway, uh, so first of all, I'd like to define an evaluation map where if we take, um, if we take some form, uh, some n linear form over our vector space, then what we can do is we can take, um, so we can fix some uh, subspace B of our vector space B, B. So this should actually be a subspace, not just a subset. And then uh, what we can do is we can look at the map that's determined by um, taking our form and plugging um, plugging an element from um, B into it. So we're going to take a form. This is our form. This is our element of B. And then we're going to plug that element of B into the appropriate slot, the kth slot of our form. And then the resulting um, and then the resulting uh, form can actually be viewed as uh, as one that's taking um, some subspace, not necessarily the whole thing, but some subspace of the n minus one fold tensors over our vector space to um, elements of the original field. So this really is just some restricted version of the usual evaluation map, which is just saying that eval k a b applied to pi y should in fact uh, 
just be the thing that you uh, get by plugging y into the kth slot of pi and then restricting the domain and codomain to be the appropriate subspaces of um, B and the n fold tensor product, respectively. OK, so that's a little bit of a mouthful, but it's it's a slight generalization of a useful con of a usual <laughs> concept, the evaluation math. And um, so now what I mean by a non-degenerate form is really I want to say an AB non-degenerate form is um, some n form over a vector space uh, where if we have some subspace A of the n minus one fold tensor power V and some subspace B of V, then we're going to say that pi is a B non-degenerate in the kth coordinate when the kernel of this evaluation map is zero. Um, and so basically this is saying that, uh, if you go back here, this is saying that um, we should never be able to uh, take some non-zero y and plug it into a slot here and then have the resulting um, value of pi of whatever we plug in for all of the x's where this y is in the corresponding slot. We can't just have that become zero identically. And this is actually, um, this is actually the case, um, for example, with the, uh, the usual dot product. Um, oh, this is actually the case with the usual dot product. Uh, if I, um, if I define this, um, for example, to be the dot product over um, fq squared, then um, if I fix some non-zero y, I'm always going to be able to choose some non-zero x so that this expression is not equal to zero. And that's the same thing as, as the corresponding evaluation map, um, where in this case k would be 2. And you could take a and b to be just the whole vector space. and um, the corresponding tensor power, that would show that the um, usual dot product over fq squared is um, non-degenerate in the second slot. And similar, a similar argument applies to the first slot as well. And, um, and so this generalizes to multilinear forms. And um, OK, so now uh, for a slightly less uh, trivial example, if we take our vector space to be FQD again, and we just take A and B to be um, as large as possible, so A is just the n minus first fold tensor power of FQD, and B is the um, and B is FQD itself, uh, then we have a ternary form pi of x y z is x one y one z one plus x two y two z two, and so forth up to x d y d z d. Um, so this is uh, this is the ternary dot product. Um, which is probably, it's probably not hard to see why one would call it the ternary dot product. If we took Z to be, uh, all the ZIs to be one, then this would be the dot product of X and Y. Um, and this is actually um, AB non-degenerate in the sense. And by symmetry, it's, it's non-degenerate in every coordinate. Um, although that isn't necessarily the case in general for ternary forms, uh, but okay. So, um, if we keep B the same though, and we change A to be uh, the n minus first tensor power of um, this set of uh, this subspace of FQD, where the first um, the first entry in each uh, vector is zero, then uh, actually using the same form, we get an AB degenerate form, and um, the reason is just that. Uh, Remember, in order to have a non-degenerate form, we needed to consider, um, we needed to have that the kernel of this um, evaluation map uh, well, we needed that the kernel of this evaluation map um, well, uh, for pi, suppose I wanted to say it this way, um, that this, we needed that this was, was not zero. So if, um, if it is zero, then the form is degenerate in that slot. If it's non-zero, then it's, it's non-degenerate. And, or I'm sorry, other way around. If the kernel is, the kernel is zero, then it's non-degenerate. And so, um, but in this case, what happens is there is something um, that we can plug in um, coming from this uh, subspace A um, which will, uh, well, 
I'll do this. So, okay, maybe I won't, maybe I won't get into the details too much because I didn't, I didn't already type this out and it might take a while, but if you examine this, you'll, you'll find, you'll find that the kernel of this, the kernel of this map is non-zero. And basically what happened is we, um, we took away the elements that could witness a certain um, y that you plug in being non-zero. That's basic. That's basically basically what happened. Okay, but I, I won't belabor it. So this is actually sensitive to the choice of a and b. Now I need one final concept before I can um, finally tell you what the main result is. Um, and so, uh, given some subset of FQD. We'll say that uh, that subset has projective index alpha when, uh, okay, so when alpha is less than or equal to um, this quantity, which is a measure of how, uh, how much the subset E is closed under scaling. So in other words, um, alpha being one here just means that um, e, e is projective. So in other words, um, if alpha is one, that means that if you take any element of E and you multiply it by any non-zero element in um, FQ, you will get another element in E. So it's totally closed under scaling and I don't want to worry about zero. Um, so this is the largest that the numerator could possibly be. And so if there, if, um, so alpha is just measuring how large the set of multiples are that are still in your original set E. And if alpha equals zero, that just doesn't guarantee anything. That's that's just no information at all. And somewhere in between says that E might be closed under scaling by some quantities, but not others. Um, but it doesn't have to actually be the same uh, multiple for any particular element of E. Um, okay, and we'll see more examples in a little bit. But basically this is a, a measure of how close E is to being um, a projective set. Okay. So, uh, so here's our theorem. Finally, so if we have, uh, so if we have a form, um, an n linear form over FQD, so this form of QDN is is just what I had earlier uh, might have called form of FQDN. So if we have an n linear form over FQD uh, for some n that's at least two. E is a subset of FQD uh, with projective index alpha, so we can guarantee at least alpha percent closed under um, scaling. Then if there exists an R-dimensional subspace A of FQD uh, n minus first fold tensor power and some subspace B of FQD so that, okay, well maybe first of all, E is contained in B, so B contains the span of E. And then A contains the span of um, the pure tensors, the pure n minus one tensors determined by E, then if that's the case, so E is somehow contained in A and B in this way, and if pi is also A, B non-degenerate, and finally, if E is at least um, Q to the R plus n minus one over n times um, this lower order quantity that depends on the projective index, then uh, all non-zero elements of FQ will be contained in the image of E under pi. And this bound is, is uh, actually sharp um, in a sense that I uh, may discuss at some point here. So, um, okay, so that's a lot of conditions, but um, notice that, okay, first of all, if, um, if we just take alpha to be zero, then, um, then this, then this whole quantity is just going to be one and we can just ignore it. And then also if we, um, if we take A and B to be this, just these respective vector spaces, so we just take A and B to be as large as possible. And um, if we also take N equals two, and then R um, is the dimension of um, A. So if we take this to be as big as possible, then R is going to be, um, d to the n minus one, which is just going to be d to the one, just d. E. Then uh, what we'll recover here is that this, uh, this bound is q to the d um, plus two minus one over two. And this is q to the d plus one over two. And this is the bound that Yosevich and Hart um, proved. Okay, so 
uh, this is actually a generalization. Um, and even in the n equals 2 case, if we uh, take this alpha to be some positive quantity, then we will actually get a slightly stronger statement. OK. So uh, all right, so this is, uh, you know, these are maybe a lot of assumptions to keep track of. So before getting into uh, the more um, technical details of when do these things actually apply to something non-trivial and how do I prove that this occurs, um, I would like to actually give you an example of something that this can be applied to. Okay. Well, besides the example that um, the examples that Yosefich and Hart already considered, because of course that, that's already done in their paper. Okay. So um, first of all, I um, want to define a type of set which I'm sure people have considered before, and I just you don't hold Alex responsible for this. I just gave this a whimsical. Um, name when I was coming up with an example. Uh, so I'm going to say that a subset E of FQ squared, because now we're looking at the case where our form is a ternary form, so n equals 3 means our form is eating um, triples of vectors. Um, and we're going to consider the D equals 2 case, so we're only looking for subsets of FQ squared. I'm going to say that a subset E is a QKL omphalos when um, E is a union of not lines exactly, but is um, is the union of um, these EHs, where H is a collection of k distinct lines um, through the origin in FQ squared, and each EH consists of exactly L non-zero points from H. And so this is actually similar to the type of thing that was um, considered in uh, one of the other um, uh, more um, specialized estimates in that same paper of um, Hart and Yosevich, but um, I, yeah, I actually, uh, okay, so it's, it's definitely something that's similar to things that have been considered before, although I don't know that they've been named precisely. And um, an omphalos is something from uh, Greek mythology. Uh, there's a story about Zeus releasing um, two eagles to fly off in opposite directions or perpendicular directions to um, determine where the center of the world was. And so the idea is that um, these sets kind of look like the paths of these eagles. There's some collection of lines that all go through the origin of the world, and um, they each contain a similar number of spots on them. Um, OK. So if we have such a set, then uh, actually it's the case that um, if pi is a non-degenerate ternary form, um, such as the ternary dot product that I gave um, before as an example, uh, then actually if um, the number of, so K is the number of lines and L is the number of points on each line. So if K cubed L cubed is strictly greater than Q to the sixth minus L minus one Q to the fifth, then actually um, pi of E cubed, this should be E cubed. Um, so that actually contains um, all the non-zero elements of FQ. And so, okay, that's kind of that's kind of interesting in the sense that it says, well, if I choose a sufficiently large number of lines and on each of those lines, I choose some sufficiently large number of non-zero points, then I'll get a set that's big enough to, um, you know, to have a, a full-sized image, the largest possible, except for maybe zero, under any given non-degenerate ternary form, which doesn't have to be the ternary dot product, it just could be. Um, but uh, to give them an even more specific example of applying this, let's consider the case where gamma is a subgroup of uh, FQ star, so a multiplicative subgroup of order Q minus 1 over S. So uh, in other words, gamma consists of S, S the, um, powers, and so its, its, index is, um, its index is S. And so uh, if we take H to be a collection of coset representatives um, for gamma, so we want H to have exactly R members, and every pair of distinct members determines a distinct pair of cosets, although H is not necessarily a full transversal of all of the cosets. Um, then uh, if we take such an H and such a gamma, then we can define the set E to consist of all uh, all scalar multiples of um, vectors that look like one y, where y is in uh, 
one of these cosets of gamma determined by H, and X is also in one of those cosets. Uh, so in other words, um, we're taking our lines to be all the lines that are of the that are that are determined by elements um, one y, where y belongs to some coset of gamma determined by h, and we're then taking all the points on those lines that are multiples of those initial points one y by some other element of one of the same collection of cosets of gamma. And so um, note then that because uh, each each choice of y determines a different line, and then each choice of x determines a different point on that line, then we actually have that gamma is a QKL on plus, where k and l um, are both r times q minus 1 over s, because the size of a, a single coset is q minus 1 over s, and we have r of them, because that's how many representatives we chose. So. If we then take E from the um, previous example that I just described, uh, using the result that we had about, uh, about QKL amphaloi in general, and plugging in that we know what K and L are for this example, that actually tells us that if this polynomial in um, Q, R, and S is positive, then um, and pi is a non-degenerate ternary form on FQ squared, then all non-zero elements of FQ can be written as pi of uh, some triple of elements in the um, set E. And so that's still a slightly weird statement. Um, so let's uh, see if it's even possible for this to actually occur. Um, there are certainly many choices of QR and S for which this does not happen. And um, OK, so uh, one where it does, oh, I seem to have. Uh, drop something here. All right, this was just a this was a reference to something. Just forget about that. Um, okay, so if we take E to be a subset of FQ squared, where Q is, um, Q is the prime um, 160,001, um, which by the way, this is the reason I chose this, this is 20 to the fourth power plus one. Um, if we take S to be 20, R to, and R to be 16. So in other words, we're going to take um, we're going to take 16 cosets, the E to be the union of 16 cosets of the subgroup of um, FQ of order uh, F, or the subgroup of FQ star of order 8,000. Then um, if we take pi to be the ternary dot product, then um, well, first of all, we see that this polynomial for the choices of QS and R um, that are given there is, is positive, so the result should apply to it. And since um, the ternary brought that product is non-degenerate, that means that um, every non-zero member of FQ star can be written as, well, pi of something like this, where the HI are from the collection of cosets that we chose, um, of which there must be exactly 16. And, um, and then the gamma I are elements of the subgroup gamma. Or in other words, they should be 20th powers. And so, um, OK, so every element of FQ star can be written that way. And then if we interpret that a couple of different ways, we see that, well, one meaning of that, if we actually um, expand out using the definition of the ternary dot product, is that um, every element of FQ star can be written as the product of three coset representatives that were chosen, some three coset representatives, times some 20th power uh, times one plus the product of perhaps three different coset representatives times another 20th power. And so this is uh, one of those maybe a little bit strange, but a wearing type statement about, um, about essentially when every element of FQ can be written as a sum of powers, but things have been tweaked a little bit. Um, and now I will say that I have spent a little bit of time trying to think about whether for this particular example, because the number of cosets or the size of the set E is so large, does is this particular version of the statement actually non-trivial? And um, I haven't yet been able to determine that, um, but at least in any case, this is a way to see that this is actually um, the every element of F, of F 160,001 uh, star is actually of this form. This also shows, and this isn't even um, weaker thing, I suppose, that um, if you take A to be the set H gamma, 
expanding out a slightly different way shows that every element of FQ star for this particular choice of A belongs to A dot A dot A plus A dot A dot A dot A dot A dot A. And so I think in the abstract, I'd actually promised uh, this. And so I apologize that this is happening, but that's just sort of the, the nature of this example. Um, but okay, so we do get results of this nature, although this isn't for a general A, this is for this quite structured choice of A. Um, okay, so are there any questions or comments about the example before I go on to um, other things? Okay, so um, all right, I won't, I won't go into this too much, but why n equals 3 and d equals 2? So unfortunately, what happens is if you take the dimension of the span of E to be L, and so the reason I would do that is because I want E to be contained in some subspace um, B of FQD. And so, um, okay, and so, and I also need to then consider um, the dimension of, um, the dimension of, uh, of A, that was a quantity I had called R back in the, the proof or the, in the statement of the initial theorem of the main theorem. And um, because A is a subspace of um, a tensor power of FQD, um, what ends up happening is that the dimension of the span of E constrains the dimension of this and the, um, and the dimension of this. And so um, what ends up happening is that you might as well take um, B to be the span of E and then the dimension of A ends up having to be, um, basically has, ends up having to be L to the N minus one, where L is the dimension of that span. And then you notice that our bound says that you need the size of E to be bigger than, um, than uh, some quantity Q to the R plus N minus one over N times a lower order thing, depending on alpha. But because E is, um, but because E is contained in this, um, in its span, E has to also have size at most Q to the L. And unfortunately, this inequality is backwards. So when you take logs and solve, you end up finding that you need this order, this polynomial of degree N minus one to be bounded above by two minus some quantity that's between zero and one. And so the only way that this can occur is in the three cases I listed before, either N is three and D is two or N is two and D is anything or D is one and N is anything. And so unfortunately, uh, this technique um, doesn't actually give as general of a result as you might first imagine. So I could have lied to you and just said, oh, we did this fantastic thing for all possible values of N and D, but that's actually not uh, true, it turns out, because the, the estimate becomes vacuous in most cases. But fortunately, not, not all of them. We just get the one that's not trivial. Um, that also wasn't considered before. Okay, so um, maybe in the last five minutes, I'll really quickly just sort of go over what the proof is. Um, so again, here's the statement. Basically, we have some subset of FQD. We have some non-degenerate and linear form on that vector space. We know that our set has projective index alpha, so it's at least alpha percent closed under scaling. Um, and then we say, well, if there was some r-dimensional subspace of the n minus first fold tensor power and some subspace b of the original vector space fqd so that a contained um, all the pure tensors from e of the appropriate dimension b contains e itself um, and then if e is at least uh, this size then fq star all the non-zero elements of fq should be images of pure tensors from e under pi um, that's that's the result and um, this bound is sharp, although I actually, I guess I probably won't discuss that too much today. Um, but OK, so what's the idea? So remember that this nu of t, this was the size of the level set for t uh, that I had defined before. And so, um, and so using applying the Fourier transform, we can see that uh, this, um, the size of the set is actually this, um, where this uh, chi is some um, non-trivial additive character over FQ. And, um, and then uh, the reason that I had defined the, the reason that I had defined the um, level set in the way that I had was because I need here for this Z, 
to be varying over pure tensors from E. And the size of that set, the fact that this is the box times um, pure tensors that can be made from E and not the span of um, that set um, makes a difference in the, the, the argument. Um, you can't get a non-trivial result if you use the, the span of um, the pure tensors that you can make from E. Um, but OK, so uh, we find that there's a main term, which is Q inverse size of the set, which again, that's, that's why that's showing up, um, size of E. And then uh, this remainder, uh, where um, the remainder is obtained by summing over all of the non-zero elements of FQ and the inner sum. OK, so, uh, so then the name of the game is show that the remainder is smaller than the main term. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a main term. And so uh, first, um, well, we square. And we see that r squared, the remainder squared, is bounded above um, by um, u plus v. Um, oh, well, I guess I, I skipped a step. So first of all, that, um, that remainder, um, OK, view that remainder as a sum in z. That's why I wrote it as the outer sum here. But um, yeah, this sum over w is an inner sum. So if you view it as a sum in z and apply Cauchy-Schwartz that way, so in other words, um, well, yeah, if you apply Cauchy-Schwartz that way, then you find that our, the remainder squared is bounded above by the sum of these um, these two terms. Um, so one for the case where um, when we double, where this SW and S prime W prime happen to coincide, and in the other case where they don't. And um, so the, we use AB non-degeneracy of the form pi um, in the case of, um, of the sum and V, um, because that's actually what uh, gives us orthogonality um, of this last sum over here. And that's what makes this entire term zero. So that, that was the motivation for this notion of non-degeneracy of the form. OK, so then we just have r squared is less than or equal to u. And we split u as the sum of c and d. And so in the original result of uh, Yosevich and Hart, what happened was this um, sum and c, which corresponded to when s was not s prime, um, we just knew that this, that this was negative. And that, or they just knew that it was negative, and and that was enough to get the, the estimate that they obtained. In our case, we have to get a non-trivial bound for this, or at least the only thing that we ended up getting that worked was using a non-trivial bound for C, um, because um, otherwise it's it's um, otherwise the result is like epsilon away from giving us something interesting in the case n equals three and d equals two. Um, and OK, and then this um, term D will be dealt with in a different way. So um, we actually can obtain a bound for C. And it's in terms of the size of this set of pure tensors. And this is basically, um, well, and also the, the projective index. So this is um, both of those things um, come into play here. And so if this, if this is um, if this is not 0, or if this is 0, then we can't, we can't get anything. Um, non-trivial. So, OK, but using the projective index, we can get a, a, we can get a strictly negative um, value for C or strictly negative bound for C. And then um, D, we can um, compute directly as this value. And then um, this looks very similar to, uh, to the main term that we had before, all the way, uh, oops, no, um, all the way back here. And so, um, these together are enough to show that um, nu of t must actually be positive, um, which shows that there must um, actually be some non-zero um, pair of elements in the um, in the level set corresponding to t, um, and so that means that uh, that means that um, that particular value is actually the output of the form for some um, when some elements of e are plugged into it. Okay, well. Uh, that is about time. So I'd just like to um, thank you again so much for having me. Um, and uh, yeah. Let's thank Charlotte. So are there any questions before I stop the recording? Okay. Let's stop the recording and then we'll, I have some questions.